Good morning, City Life. Good morning to all of you City Lifers and all of our visitors here, anyone just checking us out on, online. Uh, welcome. Thank you for checking us out. I pray that this found you for a good reason. Um, and so today we get to worship Jesus, and I'm so excited for that. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Pedro Reese, and I'm lead pastor here at City Life. And um, if you have been coming to our service now online for a while and haven't connected, connect with us. Hit that I'm new button in the notes below. We want to be able to reach out. Let's go get a cup of coffee. Let's like start living life together. Um, that's what we're passionate about. And so welcome. Welcome to this church. And uh, before we really start today's sermon, I want to talk a little bit more about our themes that we started last week. Last week. Last week, we introduced the teaching themes for our church in this whole year. It was like we spent time praying, Lord, what do you want us to like really focus on this year? What do you have for us so that by December 31st of this year, we have a firm foundation in this? We spent a year teaching on these topics. Excuse me. And we prayed. And this is what we came back. We came back with three themes. The first being invitation. Like how do we as a, as a group of people really learn to invite others into our lives, into our faith, into our homes, into our spaces, and even during the pandemic, with wisdom, I understand. But like, how do we be invitational? Being an invitational and like, uh, people who value community, we value community, but they're not always the same. Like, how do we really invite people, make room for people in our hearts and our lives, and also for our church? Like, how do we really make room for people to come and hear the gospel and say yes to Christ? Like, how do we really turn people into believers for the first time? Like, let's explore that. Let's find that out. Like, let's bring new people into the kingdom this year. Invitation. And then, like, invitation opens the door to disciple making. Like, we were really praying for a cohesive list. Not that last year's wasn't, but it's like, how, does, how do they feed into one another? Invitation opens up the possibility for disciple making. The one thing that Jesus told the church to do, the last thing he told his disciples to focus on when he left in Matthew was Matthew 28, make disciples of all people. Like That's the one thing God has let us to do here on earth. He left us to make more disciples, to bring more people into his kingdom. So how do we do that? How do we realize, like, if you can't disciple somebody right now, how do you become discipled so that you can be? Like, even our shyest people, our quietest people, our most introverted people, all of you who might say, like, I will never do that. Like, you are called to do that. How do we do that? Disciple making. And then disciple making opens the way for deeper life. Many of us are dissatisfied with our faith, and it's because we genuinely believe, but we haven't experienced it. And deeper life has a lot in it, but deeper life is that like we have this deepening relationship with Jesus that's real and consuming, that we also experience His supernatural power because we have the Holy Spirit resurrection power in us, and so the things that we hope to see and pray for can actually happen. And then also that we have this breath, like we talked about this breath, right? That we are ever growing in our experiences of deepening, of like living out with power and then growing in love, sacrifice, and service. So that we're seeing people and ourselves experience freedom for the first time and in deepening ways are like, Lad, oh, that's what I want. That's what I've been waiting for. That's what I've dreamt was possible all these years. Like that's what really excites my heart. And so these are our themes for the year. And like we, we pray that by the end of the year, we are like this vibrant community who experiences Jesus in very different ways, very new ways, exciting ways. And like that we've also like brought in more people to the kingdom. And so to do this, those are our themes for the year. And to do this, we started last week as well, our first sermon series of the year. And we're calling it Open Table. We're taking an honest look about like Luke. The Gospel of Luke. We're going to look at every time that Jesus met people at the table, like the table for a meal, and how every time the kingdom came one bite at a time. Luke is this awesome gospel account. It has two like, really important characteristics for us to focus on. 
The first one being that Luke, more than any of the other Gospels, is so consumed with God reaching the disenfranchised, the forgotten, the beaten down, the castaways, everyone that everyone forgets and hates. Like Luke, this is present in all the other Gospels, but Luke could not drop this. Like he could not forget that Jesus came for all of us, even the ones that we all have thrown away. And then the second characteristic of Luke is like that Luke is told in such a way that it seems at times to be like, well, this is like the story of Jesus' life told one meal at a time. More than any gospel, Luke finds itself at the table all the time. It's, like, it's almost as if at times like, okay, all the other stuff is just to help us get from one table to the next table to the next table because Jesus ate with people, made time. For them in intimacy more in Luke more than in any other book it was like all of this to show that like the table this place of vulnerability right this place of intimacy this place of depth this place where we uh, get to know God and get to know one another but equally important we get to be known it's like wow like one bite at a time one table at a time the gospel is coming through in the book of Luke through this vulnerable setting and so let's look at these meals to see what Jesus was doing and how he loved us because these are more than just our claims, right? This story tells us of a Savior, the God of the universe who created everything and made room for people at the table. And so today we get the opportunity to look at our first meal. Last week we introduced this by talking about eating, which Jesus did in Luke 12. Today is our first scene at the table and we're talking about how Jesus called the wrong ones to the table. So let us read and let us pray. First, we're going to pray. We're going to read from Luke chapter 5 in a moment. But let's pray before then. Let's pray for the reading of God's word for the service online. Like, let's just pray that the Holy Spirit is here with us, allowing us to take things that we need to take from today. Uh, let me pray. Jesus, I thank you for this day. Right off the bat, like, Lord, I just invite you here. I invite you into the preaching of your word and the hearing of your word. Lord, because you met people at the table all the time, and you loved them, and you loved on them. Lord, you brought all the wrong people to the table, and they had an opportunity to be loved by their Savior, loved by their Maker. I pray that we get to experience the same thing. I pray that we would humble ourselves to know like, that you love us and that you bring us to your table all the time. Every table you ever set up is an act of generosity. Help us to know that. Help us this week to take all of this and change the way we live our lives. Lord, I love you. We love you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. So we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 27, 27 to 32. Let's look at the first time Jesus brought people to the table. Uh, God's word says this. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast at his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisee and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Today, like, let's... Start by looking at how Jesus called all the wrong ones. And they like, often said yes to him. Let's just look at some background really quick because to really get to know what in the world is happening here and why it's so significant, we also just have to know like, some of the background in Jesus' story. I don't want to just throw us into Luke without knowing where we are in Luke. So up until now, he's been born, obviously. Uh, the boy Jesus, the baby Jesus, has grown up, and now he's a man. 
And now he's starting his own ministry. He's been at this time, he's been baptized by John the Baptizer, which is so important because that was prophesied, right? And that was when he received the Holy Spirit. Jesus never did any ministry without the Holy Spirit's power. Super important. And with the Holy Spirit, he goes to the desert and he is tempted for 40 days. He fasts for 40 days and he overcomes all of the Satan, all of Satan's temptations. And then he goes back to Galilee with the whole, like filled with the Holy Spirit. It says that several times, filled with the Holy Spirit. He goes here and then he goes here with the Holy Spirit and then he goes here with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes like, he starts to teach and he's starting his like teaching ministry. And he does a couple of things. He calls a couple of disciples already. He called, he's already called John. He's already called uh, John and James. He's already called Simon. Or, Peter, who will be named Peter, and he's starting, and it's like he's budding, and like people, there's this buzz around him. And then in Luke chapter 4, right before what we just read, Luke chapter 4, Jesus like reads his mission statement, what he cares about, what, why he's here in the first place. In a synagogue, he opens the book of Isaiah, and he reads this in Luke 4, verses 18 and 19. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is saying here to everyone, is like, this is why I've come. I've come for the poor. I've come for the captives. I've come for the blind. And I've come for the oppressed. Like everything that we've already talked about today, how Jesus came for all of the forgotten ones. He's like, this is why I've come. This is who I'm here to meet. Like, this is who I'm here to serve. And we need to start there because it really opens up our understanding to Jesus' heart. And I've been calling this the wrong call to the wrong one. Verses 27 and 28 tell the, set the scene perfectly like this is all the information we need to know but Jesus goes out of his way he, he goes out he sees a tax collector named Levi and he publicly calls this man Levi to follow him he literally just says follow me and then as simply as he is invited he responds simply he drops everything and he goes this man who was the wrong one. This man who was a traitor. The God of the universe sees and calls and he says yes. Okay, like it was shocking enough that Jesus called a tax collector. And then it became like even more shocking that this, the wrong one, the wrong guy, this traitor said yes. You see, he was a sinner. He was a traitor. A tax collector, Ugh, like, who wanted a tax collector? Nobody. Like, this, this is, to be a tax collector was someone who was willing to turn their back on God's special people, on his identity as an Israelite, like, his whole nation, his whole people, his whole God. Like, they equated becoming a tax collector, collector to turning your back on everything, right? Levi, this guy, he was the wrong guy to ask. Jesus, you sh could have asked anyone. Like, Jesus, you might have gotten even better results from asking, like, a leper, like, to be one of your disciples. But Levi, a tax collector, are you joking me? Like, like Jesus, like, you don't call these people. If you're trying to build a, mo a global movement here, if you're trying to change eternity here, I would not suggest asking people who everyone deliberately hated. Like, Jesus, what are you doing? You see, in Jesus' day, being a tax collector it was not just a job. Being a tax collector was that you like, made this bid to intentionally turn your back on everything that made you who you are and everything that made God's people who they were. You're like, you like, did not care. You wanted to profit off of everyone's struggle. Being a, you only made money as a tax collector by overtaxing over people. Like you only made a budget for yourself by taking more than what people owed. And so everyone hated tax collectors. 
Like we joke around now by like hating the IRS, right? But we don't hate IRS agents. Well, not most of us, at least. But not like they hated. They hated every tax collector. Levi Russ is the wrong person to ask. And we just got to stop there really quick and just reflect on how like, man, like all of us carry these lists in our heads of people who are like, God, like that's the wrong one. Like Jesus, that is the wrong person. Like Pedro, like don't even waste your time preaching to these. Like they, they'll never get it. And so much of the church is consumed by this. It's like, oh, we cannot call these people. Like, we don't want these people with us. Or they'll just say no. Like Levi, he wasn't just bad. He was like bad on purpose. Like, he intentionally lived his life like this. Like, he, Jesus, what are you doing? It's like, I, I wonder how many of us like draw the lines in places. How many of us like intentionally or unintentionally have this list of people like, like they won't say yes. I'm not going to invite them because they're going to say no. Like, I, like, fra- like oh, I'm not going to call those frat guys, they're not going to say yes. Like, I'm not going to call those athletes, they're, like, they're not going to say yes, right? I'm not going to invite that drug dealer on the corner, he's not going to say yes to me. I'm not going to make room in my life for the, that prostitute, right? Because they're too far gone. So depending on where you are in this country, it's like, oh, like, you guy can't reach Democrats, are you kidding me? Or probably more appropriate here in the New York City area, like, oh, like, God actually can't reach Republicans. Nah, like, that's a waste of time. Like, some of us say to the whole races of people, or some of us, like, say oh, whole ethnicities, like, God, like, they're too evil. They don't, like, they've hurt my people too much. You don't know what they've done. They're not going to say yes. It's like, some of us are, like, alcoholics, or people who are obese, addicts, homeless. It's like, they're not going to say yes. Like, oh, no way, Jesus. They won't say yes to Jesus, even if Jesus was standing right in front of them. I wonder like how many of us have these people on our list and like and I just want to say to you Jesus built his 12 by calling the wrong people. Some of them hated even one another. Like nobody would have liked Levi but God like so out of love called all the wrong people. Like Jesus loves you. And he loves me. He loves everyone. And he demonstrates this in calling Levi like, that's the first place that we need to start. Jesus called the wrong one, and more surprisingly, the wrong one said yes. And that leads us to talk about a table with them. Verses 29 and 30 say this, And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a, a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. Like, let's just stop there. Like, let's not even get to verse 30 yet. 29 is like, okay, like, Levi said yes, this, the wrong one said yes, that's so crazy. But then, like, to make a weird situation even weirder, even crazier, like this, the wrong one set up a feast at his house and invited Jesus, and Jesus said yes. Like, that's crazy. They're like, Jesus, the Holy One, the creator of everything, like, he surrounded himself with sinners. Crazy. That he would be willing in that culture and this day to go to the table with known baddies. Crazy. You see, in Jesus' day, I'm sorry, last week I said that the table is a great leveler. And we might have just accepted that because it's like romantic, right? I said that all are equal, all can be seen, all have a place at the table, right? And we're like, okay, we might want like, we might understand that. But then, like, we see here Jesus at his first meal, and he's reclining with these wrong ones. He's, like, sitting with them, accepting them, being with them, with people who are bad on purpose. And it's like he's just, like, sharing this intimate space with them. And then we see the disciples, somehow they hear about this, and I don't logistically know how to explain this, because there is no way in literal hell that they would have been there. There is absolutely no way that the Pharisees or their scribes would have been there. But they hear about what's happening, and they grumble to Jesus' disciples, and they ask him the question that's really on their minds. He says, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Well, like, Jesus, why do you do this? And this question points to how lost and blind the Pharisees were. It's like, Jesus, all we've ever known is a show. 
all we can put on for people is the show. Like, how can you eat with these people and not let their dirtiness affect you? Like, Jesus, how can you be around sinners and still be perfect and holy? You know, they did not get God's heart. And they did not get Jesus' mission. They didn't see how their question showed everything that they lacked. That the table was this place of intimacy and love. That this, the table was this place that like actually leveled them. You see, meals in Jesus' day, you only ate with people you could benefit from. You only ate with people who you thought were religiously as good as you or better because you want to be seen with those people. But Jesus was so whole and so healthy and so full of love for all of his people that he would even eat with sinners. He didn't care how he looked. He would spend time with them. He so loved them that he would put himself in scandalous situations to share a meal with them to show them that he loved them and he cared for them and also call them towards repentance. It's like, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? It's like, Jesus, I thought you were this holy man. Like, didn't you just read from Isaiah? Aren't you like saying that you're the Messiah? Like, didn't I hear the story where you heal, you forgave a man's sins and then he could walk again? Like, didn't you touch a leper and the leper was healed? Like, I, I don't get that. Because I only, I like, see you with sinners. And no righteous person would do that. Like, no whole person would do that. Because then their sin makes us dirty. And that was where Jesus was different. Because Jesus was somehow able to be all around our mess. And we never made him dirty. But his wholeness makes us whole. Like that's what they don't know. That's what does not come naturally to us. That somehow Jesus could touch a leper, the one disease in the Bible that was like incurable. Up to this point, up till Jesus, only two people in Scripture had ever been healed of leprosy. Miriam, Moses' sister, and Naaman. And it's like, like, it's like Jesus touched them. And he did not become sick, but they became clean. Yeah, the Pharisees didn't get that. We don't get that. Because we don't get that everyone, every single one of us, like we forget often or we want to tell ourselves different or people who don't know Jesus like don't necessarily agree with this, but like we are all broken. We're all broken. We all share Adam's condition, right? We talked about that a couple weeks ago. We're all Adam's children. We all are broken. And we carry sin, and we hurt our souls, and we hurt one another, and we're broken. We have sin that we can't remove. Like I, for the life of me, cannot fix what's wrong with me. I've tried for a long time, but Jesus can. And that's what they didn't know. They didn't realize that he was here to be our doctor. Let's talk about the doctor. The last part of the story is addressing Jesus being the doctor. Verses 31 and 32 are Jesus' response to that question, that like revealing question. He says, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is saying, like, okay, like, if you're good, then you're good. If you're not broken, then you don't need me. What he's saying here is not that there are people in this world who don't need him. It's quite the opposite. He's like, if you look at yourself, if you think of everything that you carry, if you're like really honest in a moment with truth serum, and you like say, yeah, I'm okay, I'm good, then like you're either not in touch with yourself or you can't see the world around you. We don't see all the pain and the sadness, the division, the hate, the racism, like, the famines, the war, what we do to one another, like how we're mean to one another, how we hurt our one, like one another. And it's like we can't, if we can't look in and see those things, then Jesus can't help because you're not being honest with yourself. Like Jesus said, I've come and I'm the physician. 
I've come to all of you who say, like, yeah, I'm broken. Like, yeah, I'm damaged, Lord. I'm hurting. I'm, I'm not okay. Like, Jesus, I'm one of the poor. Like, Jesus, I'm one of the captives. I am one of the blind. I'm one of the oppressed that you've come here to help. That's me. That's like, that's, that's me, Lord. When I went to Chicago for missions, uh, where, when I like, really started ministry, I had a ministry mindset, uh, a missionary mindset. It's like, Lord, I'm going to go help them. I'm going to go help whoever's in front of me. And at the end of the year, my grand realization was like, Lord, like, I didn't help anyone. Like, Lord, I am just as broken as anyone who I thought I was going there to serve. I was served as much as I served anyone because I was broken and I needed a physician. And I think that's what's so beautiful about this story. It's like, you know what, if you think you are okay, I can't help you. You don't even need me. Well, you don't need Jesus if you think you're whole. But for those of us who can like actually look at ourselves and then who are told that like Jesus came here not to be some angry Lord over us, but to be this like loving Savior who makes room for us at the table, who calls the wrong people to the table, who re- reclines with all of us brokenness, He can fix us. He can bring healing into our lives. Like He can bring genuine difference. The Pharisees couldn't see that they were lost that they were worse than these tax collectors because they thought they were better. Like they couldn't see their brokenness. They were unwilling to. But for everyone else who can say, yeah, I'm broken. Jesus is like, I can help you. I'm a good doctor. I've been healing people like you ever since Adam. But you're not a monster. You're just human. You're like everyone else. Like everyone thinks that they're the worst. And Jesus is like, you know what? Like, I'm a good doctor. I know exactly what you need. I know that everyone is broken. And I've come for you to come to the table with you. And so to close today, like, let's take this beautiful story of Jesus calling the wrong person and the person miraculously saying yes and bringing more broken people along with him. And then Jesus with the audacity to actually be with them and to love on them and to just like share time with them. So like, what does that mean for us? Like, how do we take this today? What do we do with this? I think we can do a lot, but I feel called to tell us to do two things, right? The first one is that we like all need to take an honest look, genuinely realize that every single one of us is broken. You're not whole. I'm saying that to you. You're not, we're not whole. All of us have holes in our souls. We have all hurt ourselves. We hurt one another. Jesus promises to heal us. We are like all born into Adam's nature. But there's a, been a second Adam who can come and help us. Like there's been a person who has come and helped everyone who has ever come and his way. And he still works today. And his name is Jesus. There is no other name on this earth that brings healing like Jesus. Give Jesus a chance. Let him call your name. And say yes to him. And he will bring healing into your life. You're not a monster. You're not this unrepairable mess. There have been people who are far worse than you who have found Jesus. Jesus loves you and he comes to the table to be with you. This isn't realizing that you're broken, isn't realizing that you're the worst thing that's ever been made. It's realizing that Jesus can be your doctor. And our second realization is that we reflect Levi's response for others. Like, Levi, the wrong person, got invited, and he said yes. And the first thing that he did was he brought others to the table with Jesus. Like, the first thing that he said in his new life 
was to bring other tax collectors, other wrong people to Jesus, other people who were bad on purpose to Jesus. And I just reflect and I say, like, church, let us invite other believers into our lives, right, because we're all broken. But equally as important, let's invite people who do not know Christ, who do not know, call Christ as their Lord, and bring them to the table. Bring them into your life because they are hurting and they don't have a doctor who can help them. Jesus showers his goodness on everyone. But how will they know to call on him as their doctor if they're never told? And so Jesus here says, he finishes the last verse. He says, I have, not, I, have not, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so this week, for all of us, let's repent. Let's say, ask for forgiveness for the things that we've been doing wrong. Let's also like repent that we aren't always good at bringing people who are lost to the table. Jesus loves us, every single one of us. We all have access to the table. Let's invite people to that table. Like, Lord, I am so sorry that I still sin. I'm so sorry that I don't have that many people close to me who don't believe in you. Like, Lord, I repent of that and bring me people. Because I want to tell people about your goodness. And I want to see what happens in the life of someone who goes like from death into life. Like, Lord, help me repent. Help me repent of the sin in my life that, like, I know that I do in honesty. Help me to think, like, get rid of this religious spirit that makes me think that I'm better than anyone. And Lord, um, give me the grace to ask for these, knowing that you are the doctor who can heal me. And so, church, this has been the first table that Jesus shared with someone in Luke. Like, let's think about this story this week, about how God called the wrong one, and the wrong one said yes, and he brought more wrong ones with him. Let's look at Jesus' heart, how he's so willing to share this vulnerable place with us and respond to him by repenting. I love you so much, church. Uh, if you have any questions to the sermon, email the church at info at citylifenj.com. If you want to get connected, if you want to ask me a question, Info at citylifenj.com. Write me at preese at citylifenj.com. Citylifenj.com. And uh, we'll see each other next week. We'll see each other at our MCs. Um, we love you all, and we'll see each other soon.